one that's joined us. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Lee, and I am with the City of Burlingame, and I will be a moderator. This workshop is sponsored by the City of Burlingame, the Citizens Environmental Council of Burlingame, and the Bay Area Water Conservation Agency. Before we begin, I'm going to provide some guidelines for successful participation in today's webinar. First, as you all may have noticed, all attendees are muted by default, and that's to help reduce the background noise in this presentation. Second, we will be pausing periodically throughout the presentation to allow for questions, and we highly encourage you to use the Q&A um, As folks are putting their questions, we will respond to it either by answering live or typing directly. And the second option to ask questions is to use the hand, which we will utilize at the end of the presentation. Um, and, that, and at that point, we will call upon you and then meet you to ask, to ask your question. And I'd also like to note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the BOSS website. All right, Lisa, take it away. Hi. Hi, my name's Lisa Hapich, and I'm a member of the Citizens Environmental Council of Burlingame. And I'm thrilled to be here um, to learn about how to attract good bugs to my garden with Suzanne Bontampo. Um, it's great to be partnering with the city of Burlingame and with Bosca. So just a few, few bits of information about the Citizens Environmental Council. Um, we were formed in 2009 Prior to our formation, the city of Burlingame had uh, put together a green ribbon task force, which had the job of formulating um, Burlingame's first climate action plan. So after that work concluded, members of that task force wanted to continue the work in the community and so formed the Citizens Environmental Council. Um, in the past, um, we have engaged in a variety of different um, initiatives in the community. Um, listed are just a few of them. One of them is our yearly speaker series which you're participating in right now. Um, we also um, have the Youth Climate Ambassadors Program, which has expanded to a countywide program. In that program, high school students are given the skills and experiences to um, formulate projects to implement either at their school site or in their community to impact climate change. We also um, sponsor and work to create the Student Film Fest, partnering with BHS. Um, where students fourth through 12th grade um, receive support and are able to um, submit their films on an environmental theme for the festival. We also um, have our high school um, scholarships where we support students who show a lot of promise and passion for environmental studies and um, award scholarships based on that. We also advocate in the community for sustainable practices and policies. Um, we are currently advocating for Burlingame to adopt um, strong electric reach codes. So come join us. We meet um, the second uh, Wednesday of each month right now via Zoom. Um, newcomers are absolutely welcome if you just want to come see what we're about. Um, but hopefully once you come once, you'll want to come back again and, and join in and, and work with us. Um, our website is listed right below there. Um, so go to our website to find out more about what we do. Also sign up for our newsletter that will give you more direct information about um, programs or other pertinent information. And then likewise, just um, uh, for our speaker series, um, this is the fourth of six. And so we have two more to come, but pending on how things look as we move ahead in the months, um, you know, we, we're not sure exactly how they will look, but we're still hoping to have our um, film presentation of um, Paris to Pittsburgh on September 16th. And then also on October on the 18th, we're um, hoping to still have our EV electric vehicle workshop. Um, so please um, log on to our website, take a look at us, and we'd love to see you at our next meeting. And um, once again, I'm thrilled to be here to learn about attracting good bugs to my garden. Thanks. Great. So just a few more slides before we get started with the program. So Bosca is also the other agency that is sponsoring this webinar. It is a special district that represents 26 cities, water districts, private water companies, and all of which 
purchase wholesale water from the San Francisco Regional Water System. Bosca member agencies, such as the City of Burlingame, collectively serve over 1.8 million residents and 40,000 businesses in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties. And their goal is to ensure high quality water at a fair price for agencies and their customers. And consistent with that goal, Bosco provides a regional water conservation program to support agencies in improving their water use efficiency. While we have made significant strides in water use efficiency, there is still more room for improvement. And outdoor water use actually provides the biggest potential source of untapped savings and reducing outdoor water use through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques can help conserve water to ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. And if you live in the city of Burlingame, you can actually receive up to $100 off the purchase of a qualifying rain barrel. The rain barrel must be installed consistent with the requirements as stated in the application. And last month, we actually hosted a rainwater harvesting webinar for anyone that's interested to learn more about how to install a rain barrel or how to maintain a rain barrel. And more information is provided at the website linked here on the slide. And we are also excited to announce a new smart irrigation controller program, which provides a discount on the purchase of a Rachio 3 irrigation controller. This controller can be operated on your smartphone and normally retails for almost $300. But through this program, we're providing single family residents um, a discount so that it costs about $100 with tax. And supplies are limited. However, the funds will renew July 1st. So if you aren't able to um, get in this round, the next round of funding will start in a month um, so you can um, check back on the website. And if you enjoy today's program, there are two upcoming webinars for the Spring Landscape Education Series. If you missed out on a previous webinar, such as our rainwater harvesting webinar, you can view a recording of it on the Bosco website linked here on the slide. And if you are looking for additional resources on water efficient landscaping, please visit bayareagardening.org for the WaterWise Gardening website. This site supports residents in water efficient landscaping and management. Resources include a gallery of gardens with plants identified, a plant selection tool, and a watering calculator. And I'll be happy to take any questions on our rebate programs in the Q&A chat option below. And without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Suzanne. Suzanne has over 20 years of experience as a horticulture specialist. And today she will talk about how to identify the bugs in your garden, how to keep the good ones around, and which plants are good bug magnets. So please join me in welcoming Suzanne. Yay, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I do just want to go back one slide and say this is an amazing resource. If you uh, are not familiar with it, please go and check out this plant list. This is, I, I talk about this uh, resource all the time as an amazing way to learn about more plants that will work really well in our gardens here in the Bay Area and then all the tools within that website. So yes, this is important. Okay, well let's get started. So before we begin, I just wanted to ask everyone to give me a sense of uh, how many kids are with us today. If there are any children joining us uh, in the family, if you could just give me a raised hand so I can see. Awesome, 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 awesome. Okay, any more, any more? Okay, cool. A few more? Okay, yes. Okay, awesome. So this is fun. So I just wanted to, I'm going to lower everyone's hand. I just wanted to know who's with us today because I, you know, I just like to see wh who's out there. All right. So let's get started. I'm going to start by, uh oh, I lost my cursor. There we go. I'm going to get started by testing your knowledge. So 
I'm going to have a couple of photos of uh, bugs coming up and I want to see if we think they we should squish them or not squish them. So let's get started with the first one. Squish or not squish? If we're going to squish it, raise your hand. Raise your hand if we squish this one because this guy looks really weird. All right. Yeah. He's, he's kind of strange looking. Definitely looks like someone we should squish. Okay, anybody else? Give you another second. Okay, great. All right. All right. I'm gonna uh, lower everybody's hands now. Got another one coming up. What about this one? We squish, raise your hand, we squish this one. This one looks really strange. <laughs> wow, yeah, see? I think I would probably want to squish him if I saw him in my garden. Yeah, yeah, all those spines. He looks really freaky. Okay, cool. I'm gonna lower everyone's hands. Go to the next one. Okay. All right, what about this? Squish or not squish? If we're gonna squish them, let's raise our hands. I know, it looks really yucky. All right. Okay. Okay, we got one more. Let me, tell. oh, look at, what the heck is this? What is this? Do we squish it? We squish it, let's raise our hands. This looks really weird. It's like bubbling white cotton balls. What the heck? That's crazy. All right. Well, let's lower our hands. And I just want to tell you, every single one of those was a good bug that we will find in our garden. Isn't that crazy? So what I'm going to do is I want to introduce you to our friends. So let's meet him. So anyone recognize who this superstar is? I bet we do. It's Ladybug or Lady Beetle. Uh, this is going to be one of the most common bugs we're going to see in the gardens. I'm going to read out uh, some fun facts for everybody. I am reading off my notes because I want to make sure I get it straight. I get a little nervous sometimes. We have over 450 species of ladybugs in North America. 450 different species, that's crazy. They do come in a lot of different color patterns, although they're always going to be that kind of round, uh, shiny kind of armored uh, shape. They have, uh, the ladybug adult and the larva have very big appetites and can consume over five, thousand aphids and other soft-bodied insects, but primarily aphids because that's their favorite one, throughout their lifetime. And their lifetime is either going to be about three months and it'll span up to a year. And that's because if the eggs are hatched late in the fall, then those adults are going to overwinter and hibernate and they'll, they'll live about a year. But if, they, uh, if those eggs hatch in the early part of the spring to summer, they'll just only live throughout those three months of the summer. Um, I can share that uh, the ladybugs, the adult will lay anywhere from 20 to 100 eggs uh, from or throughout spring and summer. And as I mentioned, that aphids are their most favorite. So they really are on the hunt looking for aphids. Uh, plants that attract uh, ladybugs are really going to be a variety of flowering plants that have um, uh, well, really what we're looking at are flowers with a lot of small flowers, such as lavender has a, like it's a uh, spike of small flowers or uh, like um, dill, parsley, cilantro flowers. When we let those herbs go to flower, that's going to attract them. Also, anything that looks like a sunflower or a daisy, that's going to also uh, be very attractive to the ladybugs. And I can also share that uh, to provide habitat to keep them around, is really nice where we are using like a chunky arbor mulch or like a larger bark chip as a mulch or if we've done any uh, pruning of some larger shrubs or trees like our fruit trees or like maybe a butterfly bush or um, 
a tipicina, something like that, that has larger branches, we can just layer those branches down like along the pathway. It could look attractive, but it's also providing a little habitat for ladybugs where they can live and nest. All right. All right, so this is one of those bugs we wanted to squish. Does anybody know what this one is? This is going to be our ladybug larva. I know it looks so crazy, but now that you recognize, or now that you're seeing who he is, you're gonna recognize him in the garden. They are very small. They're about, um, I'd say a little bit about half an, of an inch, uh, about half of an inch slightly larger. And they are going to look like miniature alligators. Uh, they are always going to be black. Sometimes they're completely black. Sometimes they're black with a little bit of this orangish red like uh, spot or stripes on them. I've even seen one recently that was uh, with a little bit of gray as opposed to the orangey red. And they're going to be cruising around the garden. They're gonna live for about uh, three weeks before they pupate into the uh, uh, pupa, then adult uh, form. During this time, they're going to be eating about 400 of the aphids and other soft-bodied insects. So that's pretty cool. Um, and we will see them actively cruising around the gardens right now. All right, here's our next one. Anybody recognize who this one is? Yep, this is going to be our lacewing. And uh, the green lacewings will recognize around the porch light at night. Uh, so that's how we really recognize them. Uh, really, the lacewings are going to be cruising around the garden, enjoying the nectar from flowers. They also are gathering the pollen. Uh, but they're also attracted to the honeydew that the aphids secrete. Aphids and other soft-bodied insects secrete this like sticky substance that's very sweet. It's called honeydew. And that's going to attract them. These lace wings can uh, lay up to 200 eggs during their lifespan. And uh, I thought I wrote down their lifespan. So I apologize. I don't have that. But the flowers that they like are going to be, again, things in the uh, sunflower family or the daisy family, even the carrot family, which is going to be like the dill when it goes to flower. So parsley, asters, sunflowers, uh, dill, cilantro, these are all uh, flowers that they really love. And if we want to attract ladybugs and lacewings to the garden, if we happen to notice uh, we have a lot of aphids somewhere and we're not seeing any of our natural predators, uh, there's a fun little tip you can try, which is uh, mixing one tablespoon of sugar with one cup of water. Just mix it like in a spray, a little spray bottle and spray it all around the area. And that will oftentimes attract the lace wings and uh, ladybugs. And we could try this before going for a uh, pesticide. All right, who's this? Now we, a lot of us wanted to squish this guy, but he's actually a beneficial insect. He's going to be our lace wing larva. And they're very, very tiny. They're only about three eighths of an inch. But let me tell you, I saw my first one in real life just a couple of years ago. So I've been talking about him for years and then finally saw my very first one. And since then now I see him about every spring, I'll see them cruising around, but they're so tiny, they're easy to miss. They're really cool. They're going to be one of the most ferocious uh, beneficial insects in the garden, where they are going to eat up to about 200 different types of insects. It goes the insect eggs, small insects, small caterpillars, um, soft bodied insects, as well as hard bodied insects alike. They're going to go for um, aphids, thrips, mites, mealybugs, immature white flies, small caterpillars. They just like to eat a lot of food and they eat at about a rate of one per minute. They can consume more than 200 pests per week. So they really like to just chow down. Cool thing about them, uh, you see their little piercing, they have like little piercing mouth parts, like a little hook in the front and they have these little spines on their back. When I was doing research for this program years ago, I came upon an article uh, through the University of Purdue where they were studying the lacewing larva. They noticed the lacewing larva would go in, eat a few aphids, clean them out, keep the shell of the aphid, throw the shell of the aphid on their back, 
and then disguise themselves as camouflaged with covered with aphids to go in to eat more aphids. Isn't that crazy? Talk about smart. Love them. All right. Then we have this one. Anyone recognize this one? This is a very common insect we're going to see in the garden. Yeah, this is one of my favorites. In fact, I call him my uh, spirit insect. This is the hoverfly. Pretty much follows me around uh, all over the place. I don't know about you, possibly the same. The um, hoverfly is also named surfid fly or a uh, flower fly. So it might look like a bee and oftentimes it's mistaken as a bee, but it's not a bee, it's not a wasp even though they have stripes, but they do not have a stinger. So completely innocent, but it's a fly and it's very small. And we're going to see it kind of buzz around like a helicopter around the garden where they'll stop and they'll hover and then they'll dart over and they'll hover again. They live all around the world except for Antarctica. So pretty cool. And their favorite flowers are going to be alyssum, which is their most favorite. You could also see him enjoying this yarrow here. Uh, this is in one of the gardens I was working in. They also love cosmos, lavenders, again, sunflowers, anything that looks like a sunflower, anything that looks like an aster, um, the zinnias, and other flowers, other plants with really, really tiny flowers. Uh, Jennifer, I saw that we have a question. Let's see. Yes. So this, um, so we have a question from the audience. Do you have suggestions for fruit fly prevention? I was told apple cider vinegar and dish soap, but that does not work. Oh, so for fruit flies, uh, yeah, just do it a little bit, you know, sometimes even just a little bit of wine or uh, like apple juice in the glass is fine. Vinegar should work, but sometimes the vinegar is too strong and they know they might get burned if they drop in. Um, even like a little piece of an apple inside that like dish soap where they can then kind of fall into the dish soap even though the apple is peeking up. But uh, beneficial nematodes uh, will, if the fruit flies are outside, uh, then the beneficial nematodes are going to um, their microscopic er uh, soil dwelling organisms that feed off of other larvae of uh, insects. And since the fruit fly larvae are going to be in the soil, um, then we can inoculate soils with the beneficial nematodes. They'll eat the larva. If it's inside, if it's coming from like fungus gnats coming from the house plants, it's something else we could try. But if it is really the fruit flies getting our food, food like from the compost uh, buckets next to the sink, a couple tri tricks. Either uh, empty that uh, compost bucket out more frequently, like every day, or uh, put it in the fridge. P uh, the flies won't find it in the fridge. If we find that they're coming from the drain, those could be drain flies, and you could go to your hardware store. Your local hardware store is going to have an enzyme that uh, will help clean out that drain, and it will also uh, prevent the, the drain flies from coming. So good question. All right. So. Here's our hoverfly. Now, anyone recognize who this is? There is a theme here. I've been trying to make it easy on you. This is the hoverfly larva. So because we have a hoverfly, which is a true fly, uh, in true fly fashion, the larva is called a maggot, although it's a word none of us really like to use. So I'll say that this is gonna be a small caterpillar or worm-like larva. It's only gonna be about half of it half of an inch, again, very small. But when we know who's out there, then we start to see them because we recognize them. Now I'm, I'm, I'm turning our brains on to all these awesome, great friends that we're going to see in the garden. Now we're going to start to see them. The hoverfly larva is either going to be this limey green color, or I've seen it also kind of a khaki brown. But the cool thing about it is, is always going to have this racing stripe down its back. So that's going to be the true identifier. A cool thing you can check out is at night, sometimes right before sundown, I'll go out and I'll check out the roses. A lot of times I'll see the hoverflies on the bud of a rose that is, has aphids and the hoverfly will just be perched there and then he'll be completely still, completely still, completely still, and then he'll go and attack and grab an aphid. It's wild. 
Their complete lifespan is about three to nine weeks. Uh, the um, larva is going to, um, sorry, sorry. They're, the adult's going to lay about 100 eggs during the lifetime. They could be three to seven generations throughout the spring to fall. And yes, the complete lifespan is just three to nine weeks. They're going to enjoy eating aphids, scale insects, thrips, and mites. And um, they, you know, if there is a, a nice population of hoverflies in the garden, they can seriously manage and control 70 to 100% of the aphid population. Now, here's the thing. If we've controlled 100% of the aphid population, then these insects are not going to stick around because they're still looking for food. So similar to the uh, ladybugs, they're going to... Um, as an adult, fly away looking for more food sources. So it's always nice when we see some aphids in our garden to know that we don't have to eradicate all of the aphids. We know that there's always a food source for our good bugs that are hanging out in our gardens. Okay, now this is a fun one that not many people recognize at all, especially not as a good bug. Does anyone recognize this guy? This guy is our soldier beetle. He is going to be one of the first to emerge in the spring, right when the aphids are emerging. The another name uh, that they're called are leather wings. And again, they're about a half an inch, uh, maybe slightly larger than a half of inch. We have over a hundred species of uh, soldier beetles in California, but this is the one that I commonly see in my garden and what I commonly see people bringing in in little zip-like baggies, freaking out like these are all over my garden. And I have to share that this is actually a good bug. And he is very much attracted to the honeydew that uh, the soft-bodied insects such as aphids secrete. So he's going to be looking for that honeydew and enjoying that sweet honeydew, but he's also going to be enjoying nice meal of aphid insects and other soft-bodied insects. Yes, and Jennifer. Suzanne, we had a question about hoverflies. Yeah. Um, what can we do to encourage hoverflies in our gardens? Plant a lissom. So what I do is when I'm working at a nursery or I am a uh, you know, in, talking to anyone about their vegetable gardens, because vegetable gardening seems to be really popular right now, is for every cart of vegetables, you have at least one six pack of alyssum. And because the hoverflies love alyssum, that's their number one uh, plant that they're just a magnet to. Beyond that, cosmos are going to be excellent. And then I let my herbs go to flower. So I'll let my, I plant cilantro just for the flower because we know even the slow bolt bolts very quickly. So uh, I'll enjoy the leaves while I have it. But then once it goes to flower, you're going to see uh, hoverflies uh, and they come in a lot of different sizes. There's many different species of hoverflies as well as uh, some other insects we're going to talk about in a minute are just going to be swarming the flowers of the dill, the parsley, the cilantro, but alyssum is a sure bet to attract more hoverflies to your garden. All right. Okay, we recognize this one, right? This is our dragonfly, but I like to give the dragonfly a shout out because I feel like we kind of forget about dragonflies living, especially in the more urban areas. But when I was in San Francisco, I lived up on Bernal Hill and I saw a, fly, a dragonfly on the sidewalk the size of my hand. It was huge and I was really surprised. But then it reminded that they live in marshy areas uh, and ponds, lakes and creeks. And I realized that San Francisco is really surrounded by so many of these water sources that they like. What I know about uh, dragonflies is that they will lay their eggs in these marshy waters. The eggs are going to be very, very tiny, the size of the period at the end of like a sentence. Um, and they can be in the water uh, as a larval form up to about, you know, maybe two years. But as an adult, they're only going to live for several weeks. But during that time, they are flying around uh, looking for flying insects to eat, such as those fungus gnats, the fruit flies, really excellent for, excellent for mosquito control. And they just scoop these insects up midair in their 
and then our little arms kind of create like a basketball hoop and then they just nibble them as a snack as they fly. They will uh, travel up to three miles from their home looking for food. So they're very, very good hunters and they really do cover a nice space. And then I mentioned that they are going to be devouring about 500 of these flying insects throughout their lifespan. Something to keep in mind though, is because they live in the waterways, it's really important to reduce our pesticide usage, uh, reduce uh, the pesticides that are going to be harmful for our waterways, and reduce the synthetic fertilizers that also find their way into the waterways. Uh, products like mosquito dunks or mosquito bits, these are going to be a beneficial bacteria that uh, act as a larvicide for uh, mosquitoes only. So there is no impact on the dragonfly larva. Uh, there's no impact on the dragonfly. So that's where we really want to uh, go if we are needing to control mosquitoes. Okay, this is a very strange one indeed. And we saw a up close picture of it earlier. What is this? This is gonna be our parasitic wasp or peritonoid wasps. These are going to be a family or uh, a group of these beneficial wasps. Nothing that we would consider. I use that word wasp and I know people, we all think of like, oh, we're gonna get stung. These are actually very, very tiny. They're 1 16th of an inch to 5 16th of an inch. Uh, I call these the micro pollinators because they will hover around those same flowers that the hoverfly hovers on. Again, the cilantro flowers, the parsley, the dill flowers. When we have those in flower, you'll see all these tiny, tiny micro pollinators. Those are actually the parasitic wasps buzzing around. What they do, so cool, they actually lay their eggs on the host. In this case, it's tomato hornworm. Um, in this picture on the left, I'm not exactly sure, maybe a leaf roller. And those eggs, like this tomato hornworm, thinks it's just decorated with some bling, has some accessories on. What's going to happen is, is those eggs are going to hatch. Those little insects are going to burrow in and just devour that tomato hornworm as the best meal ever. This is where they got that idea for that movie Aliens with Sigourney Weaver. It's kind of gross, but it's also kind of interesting, uh, kind of crazy. Um, Jennifer, I saw another question came in. Was it something that I can answer? Um, yes. Uh, so this is kind of going back to what you just said about the Elysium. Um, is, it, is Elysium the small white flowers? They are low growing flowering plants. Um, if you can confirm that. Yes, and I'll have a picture of Alyssa in a minute. So stay tuned. It's right a couple more slides up. But yes, and it also comes in a kind of a lavender and kind of a, a orchidy pink color. So you can get a mix, but white is the most common. And it is very low growing. All right. So I tried to pick a really nice picture because I know so many of us do not like these, but what are these? It's our spiders. Spiders are going to be the most beneficial insect around the entire world. You can gather all the insects that spiders eat within one year equals the weight of 50 million people. Crazy. Here's a cool thing. There's over 30,000 types of spiders around the globe. So many spiders, right? A lot of us just want to go, ew, when we see them. It is kind of weird. Um, I'm not a super fan of spiders uh, inside my house, but I don't mind them outside. Although come fall, when they start, some of the spiders make webs. You have to kind of walk through the garden to get rid of the webs where you get a web on your face. However, there's all, only a small percentage of spiders that are web weavers. Most of them are uh, going to not build webs we're actually going to see them, the base of flowers, the base of a plant, they're actually hiding behind, so to speak, trap doors, waiting for an insect to come up so they can ambush it, jump on it, devour it. So spiders, um, one of the most common ones I see in my garden is actually the crab spider. I always see a crab spider on my sunflower. They're really neat. I actually uh, would like to add a photo of them on this uh, program, but this guy is so cute. I think he's pretty cute and I think it's less uh, icky to look at. 
All right. And then we have, well, we recognize at least the one on the left, right? It's our bees. So the pictures on the right, we have our metallic green sweat bee, which is a native, uh, very small, a uh, little smaller than uh, like a small housefly. And then we have another variety of sweat bee in the middle uh, inside the California poppy. Again, uh, like a small housefly is about the size. But understand we have over, and then the picture on the left, of course, is going to be our European honeybee. But as far as our native bees go, we have over 4,000 species of, ba of native bees in North America. And uh, together, they grew, uh, our bees grow, uh, together form the largest group of pollinators. So it's pretty cool. 30% of our native bees are going to actually nest in tubes such as uh, from hollow plant stems, like from uh, reeds or bamboo, if you can imagine. But 30% of our native bees are actually going to be ground, uh, ground nesters. So unlike our European honeybee that actually uh, will nest in like a hive, these guys are going to be nesting um, either by themselves um, or they're going to have very, very small kind of uh, family communities. Uh, nothing as elaborate as like a hive, similar to our European honeybee. Uh, something that's really cool is to uh, plant, again, a variety of flowering plants, agastaches, lavender, sunflower, cosmos, all the all the flowers we've mentioned. Here we've got our California poppy and then we've got a euphorbia that I, I've seen them on my garden, but not just those plants. Uh, I see them on so much. What I can encourage you to do is to look around and see what are the bees really enjoying. You know, I know the bees love when basil goes to flower, uh, especially those um, tender perennial basils, the African basils that make like this nice dome or like the Tulsi basil. Uh, some of the salvias, they'll go uh, just bananas for. So look about, look around and see what they really love. It's cat mint, I know they're crazy for cat mint as well. And then plant more of that. And what's ideal is to have swaths that are in patches of three by three. And then the bees are really just going to uh, hone in on those patches of three by three. And not all of us have that much space we can dedicate to one type of plant, but just do the best you can. And in fact, sometimes one plant is all you need and it will uh, encompass a three by three space. But that's what's gonna be ideal for our bees, specifically our native bees. So when we invite the beneficials, what we really want to do is we're inviting the three Ps. We're inviting the uh, pollinators, which will uh, pollinate our plants, increase our yields, especially with our food crops. We're inviting the predators. So as I've demonstrated, most of these insects that we've been looking at actually are on the hunt to eat a protein meal. And oftentimes it's not the adult, it's actually the larva or the juvenile form of that insect. And then we also have the parasitoids or the parasitic uh, insects, such as the little micro wasps that we'll see uh, taking care of some of the insects in the garden. They use these insects as a nursery for their young, essentially. And Suzanne, we have a couple of questions. Yes, let's have them. Yeah, so the first question is, um, will you be showing pictures of plant pests? I will not be showing pictures of plant pests, but I'll be showing you some resources where you can dive into some plant pest problems. I, uh, I know I have another program coming up that's going to talk about um, plant pests um, and you can get that information, I guess, on my website, because I just realized it wasn't through Basqua, it's through City of Santa Rosa. Um, but that information will be at the end. You can go to my website, which is plantharmony.org, and that information will be there. Great. And um, speaking of resources, do you have a resource that you recommend on where to find a list of flowers that you've been mentioning? Uh, yes, I can offer that in a couple minutes. So uh, yes, in a couple minutes, I'll, I'll have a slide that will have a, a link to where you can get some information on that. Great. And there's one more, but um, would you like to wait until the end? No, we could take it right now. 
Okay, um, so this is in regards to bees. How do you best provide habitat for ground dwelling bees? Okay, great question. I, when we, when, because we know that they're ground, um, so we have the ground nesters, um, and oftentimes in our gardens, we're going to lay mulch around our garden, which is I, what I recommend, especially the chunkier mulch, like arbor mulch you get like at Linkso, or uh, like a chunkier bag mulch, even like a cedar chips, things like that. However, for my ground dwellers, I'm going to leave some areas of my garden completely uh, ungroomed. I'm not going to till or cultivate those areas of the garden. And that's usually um, sometimes like along fence lines behind perennial beds or kind of in between perennials where I maybe can't see that the, there's no mulch in that area, but I know that uh, it's going to be a nice habitat where I know my bees are going to be hanging out. So. I've accidentally uh, seen a bee coming out of a tunnel, or actually it was going into a tunnel, and um, I accidentally covered it up. So I was weeding, it was happening really fast. I hope he got out, I felt really bad, but it doesn't matter. We're going to leave some areas just kind of raw and just you know do the best we can. All right, so I have a couple more things to share. Uh, this is a photo. And there's a picture of Alyssa I'm down in the lower left. But I just like to see, uh, invite you to look at these flowers and see what do all these flowers have in common. So we've talked about it a little bit, but a couple of the key takeaways I'd like you to recognize is that we have two kind of categories here, which really are all under the umbrella of one category. We have flowers that look like daisies or sunflowers. So we have the Cosmos, the Ridgeron, the Glardia. And why those are important is we might be seeing one single flower, but with that one single flower, we actually see petals. Those petals are actually the rays. And what's in the center, that button or that cone, is actually made up of hundreds of other tiny, tiny flowers. And that's what our uh, beneficial insects are gonna be attracted to. And then on the left, I mentioned we have a lissum. Right above it, it's hard to see. It's actually um, mint or basil that's gone to flower. And then right above that is the yellow yarrow. These are important because they're made up of clusters of tiny, tiny flowers. So again, we're looking at having a variety of flowering things all around our garden, blooming at different times of throughout the spring, summer, and fall months that are going to be made up of a lot of tiny flowers to attract our beneficial insects. Now there is a question about basil. Um, yeah. Is basil growing in the bunch? Basil, uh, when we plant the basil, you know how at some point it starts to bolt and we really want to nip those flower buds down so we can continue to harvest the leaves? That is uh, typically like the uh, Italian basil that uh, we're so familiar with. But there's a lot of other varieties of basils out there, such as the Thai basils. Uh, we'll be nipping those as well. However, there's another category of basils that's newer on the market that I've been seeing around garden centers, or you could get the seeds and such. It's these uh, uh, basils that are from like the Middle East, from Africa, from India, and they actually are woody. They, in a mild climate, and in Burlingame, if you protect it from any type of frost that might happen throughout the winter, because it's very frost light, you might only have a couple days, but they actually could be perennial. And they actually uh, create a dome and they're in flower, but we could still be harvesting the leaves off of them. So those are the basils I've discovered that the bees go to swarm it. It's wild. It's a lot of fun to check out. And as you know, bees have no interest in stinging us. I can be gardening right next to a bee. I can have a bee even land on the back of my hand. I'm not scared. I'm not worried because I know that bee is actually a hard worker just wanting to gather some pollen and get back to its, uh, its little home. So and I can also share that many of the native bees don't have stingers. So uh, just a side note to that. But um, yeah, hopefully that was the answer, a long answer to your short question. 
And then uh, something else that we can uh, do is build a, a bee nesting block. So these are for the 30% of our native bees. Uh, you can get a template on the uh, xersis.org website or what I do is an internet search. I'll just type in the search bar, um, bee nesting block xersis or just bee nesting block template things like that. And you'll get these templates will come up and it's kind of cool. You can learn more about the bees that nest in bee nesting blocks. It's a fun project to make. For those of you out there that are kids or if you've got kids in the family, this is going to be a, a Pester Pals activity guide. Um, this is going to be a booklet that really dives into learning about and discovering all those uh, good bugs in the garden. You can go to the ourwaterourworld.org website and in the search bar you type Pester Pal. Um, it's, uh, you'll just have to scroll down a little bit and you'll see Pester Pal and activity guides for kids. You can download it, print it out. Everyone got uh, one PDF from uh, the activity guide today as a gift. Uh, this is also going to be the website that you go to get, to get the 10 most wanted, and I'm sorry, I don't have one right in my fingertips, but the 10 most wanted uh, good bugs in your garden is actually going to be the brochure that features many of the bugs that I've talked about today, and it'll also have a plant list of plants that attract the beneficial insects. And please feel free to email me after the program. My email will be on the last slide and I actually have a, a plant list that I can email you this afternoon or you know, the next day or two, no problem. But those are going to be your resources. So the Pester Pal Activity Guide, 10 Most Wanted Good Bugs for Your Garden, and then email me and I'll send you the handout that I use when we have a live program. And if you want to order bugs online, if you're not familiar with uh, Rincon Vitova, there are uh, good bugs for every bad bug that we're faced with. Uh, Rincon Vitova is our local insectary down in Ventura. It's a multi-generation family business. Uh, we can have uh, ladybugs that eat powdery mildew, uh, good spider mites that eat bad spider mites and so forth. But it's a pretty cool resource. They uh, do sell bugs to all of us, uh, big commercial ag farming, all the way down to just you and me for our home garden. And they are a wealth of information and they're super friendly and nice. So I encourage you to check them out. From there, I want to remind us to also invite the birds. The birds are eating bad bugs too. Birds, 90% of birds eat uh, bugs at some point in their lifespan. Even hummingbirds will hunt for insects when they're feeding their young. So it's kind of cool. So I like to invite my birds and I invite them by, again, planting a diversity of flowering things. I have shrubs, I have trees for them. And I also like to welcome the bats. So remember that there's 16 species uh, of bats in the San Francisco Bay Area and 24 species of bats throughout California. They live in every type of habitat and they're extremely diverse from eating bugs all the way to pollinating other plants. So uh, bats are kind of cool. And if we look out at dusk, we typically see them even in the city environments, but typically if we're closer to some type of a city park. So a couple things I want to share uh, when we want, we want to create a habitat by growing diversity. So I've said it before, we want to plant a variety of flowering trees, shrubs, and perennials. If we just have container gardens, we just want to try to plant as many flower, different types of flowering plants within that container garden. So we need to work with what we got. I know not all of us have these like big outdoor uh, massive spaces to plant. This here is a picture of the garden for the environment. Just for some of you that have been there, you might recognize it. And the reason why I like to showcase this picture is because in the center is raised beds. They are registered CS CSA and they do do a harvest every week and donate that harvest of produce. But along the entire perimeter of this garden is uh, planting beds of trees, shrubs, flowers. And there's something in bloom just about every day of the year because we're in the Bay Area. And the reason why this is so important is because it's going to attract all the, uh, the beautiful beneficial insects, the pollinators, and the birds in that we need to keep this garden in balance because this garden has not seen a drop of pesticides since 1990. 
and it's an amazing uh, food producing garden. So similar to that, I practice this method in my own garden where I don't use a drop of pesticides, but I've got flowering plants all around integrated near, uh, near my raised beds and even around the borders of my garden. So we don't have to have the flowers so close to the raised beds, but uh, within a proximity, you know, maybe on the other side of the path. I also like to offer a water source. The water source could be as simple as a glazed saucer with some pebbles in it. And then I bring the water up about halfway up the pebbles. And the reason why the pebbles are so important, you can also use tiles, but the pollinators will land, the beneficial insects, not just pollinators, will land on the pebbles and then they can access the water without drowning. We're going to let some uh, flowers go to seed. We're not going to deadhead everybody. I'll deadhead my flowers throughout the peak season of that plant, but then I will let it go to um, seed so that the birds can enjoy it. And as you know, with the Japanese anemones or the clematis, the birds actually use that tufts for nesting. We talked about using chunky arbor mulch to provide habitat and shelter for some of our good guys. And then we also talked about leaving some of the area raw and um, ungroomed. I felt like I wanted to say one more thing about that, but I don't remember. Oh yeah, the water source. So sometimes people will ask me, what about mosquitoes? Well, I'll share that right now, my bird bath is pretty shallow and I'm filling it up every day with water. And by the end of the day, it, that water's evaporated out. So if the water source is shallow enough, that water's gonna evaporate throughout the day and we're replenishing it daily. So it won't be, uh, I'm not encouraging anyone to um, create a habitat for mosquitoes by any means, because we know how bad that can be. And then the last thing I want us to consider is our pesticides. So when we talk about pesticides, I am always talking about eco-friendly pesticides. So I'd like just to offer that out the gate. I'm only talking about, uh, we always want to choose less toxic. We always want to choose the eco-friendlies. But these are all pesticides designed to kill something. So keep in mind, we want to know our target. We want to use them as a last resort. We want to uh, uh, spot apply, only apply the pesticides where the problem is, where the problem pest is, and avoid spraying other areas. The best time to spray is at the end of the day, right before sundown, uh, right at dusk. And the reason why is because most of our pollinators and our good bugs are less active during that time. Understand that eco-friendly pesticides, uh, as I just mentioned, are all, they're designed to kill something. So it doesn't mean, even though it's eco-friendly, doesn't mean it's risk-free. We still want to use it with caution. We want to use it as last resort. We want to see if there's other ways to manage the pest problem before going for the pesticide because it, even insecticidal soap can impact some of our good guys. Identify our pest is key. If we don't really know what the pest problem is, it's going to be hard to go for a pesticide if we need to use it. Then from there, we want to understand the life cycle of that pest. So what I mean by that is, for instance, spittle bugs. Spittle bugs show up in around March, early spring. It looks like someone spit on your plants. It's totally weird. It's totally kind of gross. But I know that that life cycle of that pest is typically just one week, two max. And I know that by blasting it off with water typically manages the problem. I'm not really worried about it because I know it's low impact. But if I knew that it was going to last a little longer, maybe I'd take a different type of action. We also want to understand the pest habitat and the timing of which that pest comes out, where it has a population boom. And then we also now know that we've got some natural enemies that can manage that pest. So when I start to see a pest problem, uh, uh, the populations build, I then start to look and see where are my soldier beetles? Where are my ladybug larvas? Where are my lace wings? I get really excited when I see lace wings uh, fluttering around my garden because I know that they're going to be laying eggs and that those little aphid lions, those little lace wing larvae are going to be out on the hunt really soon. A couple online resources I'd really encourage you to check out. So uh, for the person that asked about pest identification and uh, if I was going to talk about any bad pests, there's a lot to talk about, so that's why it's a whole other program. But you can check out, well, everyone, I invite you to check out these two websites. So we have Our Water, Our World, 
which is ourwaterourworld.org. At the Our Water Our World website, there, there is a catalog of fact sheets that uh, talk to pest problem solving by topic. So you'll see the fact sheets with different topics such as aphids, uh, ants, yellow jackets, uh, maybe how to grow beautiful roses organically, that's another topic and so forth. So check that out. I can also share that there is an ask our expert feature. It's a little hard to see on the screen, but if you uh, go to the uh, home page, you click on ask the expert, it opens up to an email platform. That email gets sent to Burke the Biointegral Research Center, where there's a team of entomologists and chemists that will answer your question Monday through Friday within 24 hours. And then of course, the UCIPM website is a wealth of information that dives into pest management right here in California in our Mediterranean climate. So check that out. There's a galleries of pests, galleries of good bugs, galleries of all different kinds of diseases and problems that your plants could be faced with. Tips on maintaining your good garden. Well, we didn't go into it, but when we build healthy soil, we've got healthy plants. Healthy plants are less likely to have bad pest problems. We're gonna use organic fertilizer. We're gonna mulch most of the areas in our garden to conserve water and to feed our soil. But we're gonna leave some areas of the garden kind of raw and ungroomed. We're gonna know our sun, what kind of sun exposure we have so we can plant the right plant in the right place. We're going to water deeply once plants are established, really get nice deep root systems going. We're gonna monitor for pest problems. We're gonna reduce or eliminate pesticides altogether because we've invited in so many amazing good bugs. We don't need those pesticides anymore. Then we're going to enjoy our garden. So in close, I like to share. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Everything is connected. And so I hope that this program has uh, inspired you to get out into your gardens today and go on a hunt and try to find some of the friends that are out there working really hard to help you so you don't have to use pesticides. So I am happy to answer any questions uh, please stick around. If you did not get your question answered, if a question comes up later, don't hesitate to email me. Go to my website, join my newsletter where I send out like a weekly tip about either a good guy you're going to see in the garden or how to solve uh, a bad pest problem that might be, uh, you know, creeping up. It's all about kind of uh, keeping um, balance within the garden is the tips I give. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and attention. And yes, we will be here to answer some more questions. Great. So the first question we have is, do you have a suggestion on where to buy an already made a nesting block for bees? Should we be gearing it toward certain bees in the Bay Area? That is such a good question because guess what? I see nesting blocks all around. I see them at um, garden centers. I was seeing them like at uh, hardware stores that might have a gift shop. Um, even the Osh, Orchard Supply Hardware, when they were still in business, they were selling bee nesting blocks. They've really become quite popular uh, kind of as a novelty item, but not just as a novelty, they actually work. The trick with bee nesting blocks is that they need to be um, no less than eight inches above the ground. So they really wanna be perched up a little higher, higher the better, um, and facing either the morning sunrise, so facing east or facing, uh, you know, the southeast, so where they can really get that morning sun because they want the heat on the block. You can also, uh, I'm sure that there's different um, conservancy, nature conservancy groups that will, you can get them online. Um, I'm sure the Audubon Society might even have, they've got a gift store online, they might have it. Uh, Xersis might have a resource where to buy them online, but they are more common than they used to be. Great. Um, so we have a question about carpenter bees. Um, one of our attendees thinks that they have them at their, under the waves of their house. And currently they have been making a solution that consists of water boiled with citrus peels and they apply it as a spray. And they're wondering if there's anything else that they can do. They understand that they're good pollinators and so they don't want to kill them. 
I know it's a real bummer that they actually can be a problem, right? They're getting into the eaves of our houses and they actually can cause quite a bit of a problem. So, well, this is a great opportunity to get a bee nesting block out. So it's an alternative place. I've seen at um, some of the home improvement stores like Home Depot, and maybe you can get it online, is actually where it's almost like a trap. It's a live trap where it um, attracts them and then you can re-release them. Now, some of the models actually have a pesticide inside them. So I would eliminate the pesticide. I would still just want to attract them. So drive them away from your eaves, drive them into another location uh, that is more attractive to them and then maybe re-release them. If you can find the holes in the eaves where it sounds like you might not always easy to access, but even getting a little bit of diatomaceous earth and kind of puffing the diatomaceous earth in there, sadly, it will be um, killing the populations that are in there. Uh, and then just closing it up with wood putty. So you can also, um, yeah, that's going to be the best thing. You can also, to, as a preventative, get some really fine netting uh, or really, really fine screen and put it under the eaves to prevent them from even accessing that area. But it would have to be a very small hole, like about, uh, I'd say less than a quarter of an inch. And that will prevent them from trying to burrow in in the future. Um, so this next one isn't a question, but just a comment. If you can go, um, they just want to go back and see the slide on tips of how to maintain a good bug garden. Yep. And that's a whole nother program that I dive into as well. And we'll be talking about a lot of these tips in two weeks. It, it's, uh, no, next Wednesday, the 10th, City of Redwood City um, and Basqua, we're doing another program. It's on Wednesday, the 10th at 7 p.m. And I'll be talking about maintaining a garden through the summer months. And I'll be talking a lot about these practices. So if you wanna join that program, so we have a question on what options are there to use as mulch if they don't want to use wood chips? Well, I know people will use gravel, but gravel doesn't, um, when it, it won't break down and feed the soil the same way. And it can be quite problematic in some applications. You can also use, um, I'll use rice straw in some areas of my vegetable garden. That's something you can get at a feed store. Rice st straw is great because it's um, very economical and you get a lot of it. Uh, and because it's uh, rice, it's high in silica. So it will not decompose very quickly. It actually holds its structure for a long time and it can mat down very thinly like if you don't have a lot of space where you can build up multiple inches of like uh, wood chips. And uh, that is something that I found works really well. I know people have also done layers of like newspaper around plants that will decompose over time, but it does need to stay wet. And in some cases weighted down with maybe wood chips so it doesn't blow away. Um, and then just nature's mulch, the leaf debris that falls from the trees is mulch. Great. So we have a, a couple of attendees that have some citrus trees and um, their pests that they're seeing are white flies. And so they're wondering if you have any beneficial bug solutions on white flies on citrus. Yeah. So uh, if I see white flies, uh, first, I want to get a, a yellow sticky card that you can either purchase or you make with um, a yellow piece of paper with clear packing tape sticky side out or yellow, um, you can get like yellow duct tape, but I might get like um, yellow paper and just put clear pa uh, tape sticking out. So and I want to clearly identify that that's what I have. And then uh, white flies are typically an indicator of overwatering. So I'm going to want to be really mindful that I'm watering deeply and I'm letting the top few inches of that citrus dry out before watering. If it's an established citrus, you're going to really want it to water it deep and wide and really let a top couple inches dry. If it's a citrus that's in a pot, then just lightly. 
And then you might want to open up the canopy a little bit, get some more air circulation in there. Uh, from there, blasting the inside of the plant really well with water. And then know that beneficial insects will come. We talked about the, um, the lacewing larva will eat the, uh, the nymphs of the white flies. Uh, the ladybug larva will eat the nymphs of the white flies. Uh, the parasitic wasps will come in and probably work on them a little bit, but it's primarily going to be those two. Oh, and you know, the least, uh, the hoverfly larva will also. Great. Um, so one person asks, we have a lot of roly polies in our garden. Are they good? I know. I just got this question the other day as well. Uh, roly polies are good if you are uh, really geared into composting. So we really like the roly polies. They're a part of the soil food web. They do a really great job of decomposing organic matter. However, they also really love to annihilate your little veggie starts. They totally like attack the stems and knock them over and just gnaw at them. They'll eat your strawberries. They'll eat your raspberries. They kind of are a pest in the garden as far as I'm concerned especially when the populations are above a threshold of tolerance. So a couple tricks I like to use, I discovered by accident, is making a beer trap where I used to make them for snails. Snails and slugs don't care so much about the beer, but the roly poly sure do. So just get, you know, like a lid of a, um, like a yogurt container or uh, any type of lid of like a large bottle and just put some, uh, like a deli container or even a shallow deli container. I put it, I dig it into the ground so that it's flush, the top of it's flush with the soil. And I just pour some beer in there. It doesn't have to be anything special. And trust me, the roly polies will dive in there for the last party of their lives. <laughs> Great. Um, so someone's asking about bumblebees. Um, they have lots of bumblebees and they are wondering if they are a powerhouse pollinator. Wow, I love that. Yes, they're a powerhouse pollinator. All of our bees, I would say, are. Especially if you start to look really closely at them, you see them gathering the pollen on their haunches. It's so cool. Sometimes their little fur on their faces gets covered with the pollen. Uh, yes, that is wonderful. Great. And we have um, a question about adding colorants to the mulch. Um, one person's wondering if it's bad for their garden. Um, and let's see, are colorants added to mulch bad for the garden, for the vegetable garden, or habitat for bug-friendly gardens? Wow, what a great question. The colorants are all going to be food-based dyes. So they are not going to, in theory, pose any harm or threat to your garden, to the soil, or to the habitat. So I would say that it shouldn't be an issue at all. Great. Um, and we have a request to go back to the John Muir quote uh, slide. Of course. Great. Um, so, one. great. Um, one person's asking, any ideas for leaf miners on beet or chard? Oh. Uh, once they show up, they tend to be in every leaf already. Yeah, that is um, a real big deal, right? Totally gross. So the vegetable leaf miner, which is going to be in beets, chard, um, spinach, uh, there's a few more, so pardon me. That's actually a fly that's going to come and lay its eggs on the back of the leaf, and it looks like little mini grains of rice lined up together as opposed to a single grain. If it's a single little egg, then that's usually the uh, hoverfly larva egg. But if it's multiple, like three or more, then that's going to be the um, leaf miner. So I'll go, and I know it's going to be on these particular vegetables. It's not going to be on something that isn't one of these vegetables. And I'll just scrape it off with my fingernail I will also, I've heard a lot of friends that are estate gardeners and have to manage organic uh, estate gardens for the chefs at that estate, will do a line, a string, and then every like 
four feet, we'll use a blue sticky card. The color blue, let me see if I, the color blue is kind of like this shade of blue. So I know this is an eraser, but this shade of blue, same as the blue painter's prep tape. So that tape we would tape off in a room if we're gonna paint a room. I would put that like on a card, you know, something that's kind of firm, wrap it sticky side out and either hang it on a stake or on that string along that bed. And you're gonna attract a lot of those uh, leaf miner flies, the adults. That's gonna reduce some of the populations, but really monitoring. And I don't even plant my chard once the weather gets warm, that's when the leaf miner fly is in full force. So I now only plant chard in the uh, late fall th and through the winter months and in early spring. And once the weather warms, I yank it out because it's just covered. It's disgusting. Great. So our next question asks, what do you do if ants are keeping the good bugs away from the pest? Mm, yeah, they sure do that. So that ants that are going to be an indicator of another problem because what they're doing is they're farming that honeydew that the aphids and the uh, scale insects and the thrips are creating. And so what you wanna do is go up higher into the branchlets and see, lo and behold, you'll have some type of other pest insect and the ants are going to be protecting them. So I'll start by blasting that plant with a, a strong stream of water to eliminate the aphids or to reduce the aphids significantly. I've also washed off a good percentage of the honeydew and now the ants are no longer interested. You can also make a barrier for the ants. So let's say if we have a plum tree and we see the ants are going up the plum tree. Well, I can go again, get that tape sticky side out and wrap it around my the trunk or any of the branches where I see the ants and then you can get uh, something like uh, a pest insect glue or tanglefoot and uh, put that, just uh, paint a very thin uh, layer of the sticky insect glue on top of the tape or other banding material. And then we've created a barrier so the ants can't cross. And then after a week or two, we can take that banding material off. We can replace it if we need to, things like that. Great. Um, are cedar mulches and redwood mulches bad for putting around veggie plants? Um, I don't think so. I'm not sure of any reason why they would be bad. Um, typically I use those in walkways and I know that sometimes, you know, uh, the redwood's not going to decompose very quickly at all. Um, that's one of the qualities of redwood. Cedar might have some aromas that might act as a repellent, but I don't think so. I've built raised beds out of both products, so I don't think that there would be any reason why that would be a problem. Great. Um, how do you get rid of pincer bugs uh, between artichoke leaves? They are probably my worst enemy. So sadly, the artichokes, they really get into the artichokes. So when I harvest my artichokes, I have a bowl of water and then I've submerged the artichokes and I really keep rinsing them and agitating them and they just keep coming out. And then I just flush them down the sink. I just hate the pincher bugs. Uh, a couple tricks. I, I think pincher bugs might be the hardest, the earwigs might be the hardest to manage. A couple tricks is you can get a roll of newspaper. I hear that you can get moist newspaper, roll it up, and they'll go in there at night. I have seen that, but I don't use that as a control. I will use diatomaceous earth, which also works for the roly polies, and also will work for the ants. What happens is, is that the diatomaceous earth is not toxic at all. It's like a microscopic diatoms or microscopic fiberglass and it gets on the exoskeletons of these insects or like on the outside of like the snail or slug. And it actually slices them, it dehydrates them and it's very effective for management. However, in our climate, we get a lot of moist evenings. So there's that condensation or that dew dewy mornings. 
Or if we overhead water, the diatomaceous earth will get gummy and it won't be as effective. It also is a lung and eye irritant, so you don't want to breathe it. You don't want to inhale that diatomaceous earth. We're not um, built to do that. It's a very fine dust, like chalk. But it works really well if you do a little barrier around each of the plants, that could help. And the earwigs, um, wait, oh, one of the insects we talked about, I think the uh, lacewing larva might go after the larva form of the earwig, but I'm not 100% about that. Great. Um, so our next question is, what time of day is good to blast the plant with water? I think you were talking about that earlier. I'd say any time. Of course, earlier the better, because you do want the plant to dry, especially if you're, um, if that plant is prone to any type of fungal problems like black spot or rust, um, I would just blast it off early in the day is great. But if you're, you know, just getting home and noticing it and it's three in the afternoon, blast it off. We are in our uh, moving towards uh, our summer solstice. So we're getting longer daylight hours by the day. So we are in a good place to, um, you know, plants are drying off pretty quickly before sunset because there's so much more time for them to dry. Great. And does borax help discourage insects? Um, I know that there are some baits that you can make specifically for ants that have borax as an active ingredient. However, I am not sure how to make them. I don't know what the, um, you know, the ingredient proportions would be. So at the moment, I would, if it's not indicated on the label to use it for that, I, I wouldn't use it for that. I'm not able to give you any guidance. I would probably have a density to work with um, diatomaceous earth because I know it's not going to be lethal or toxic on any level. And um, there are instructions how to apply it on the bag. Great. Um, and we have another question kind of going back to the white flies. Um, do white flies, do you know if white flies attack apricot trees? My apricot tree is not producing fruit this year and it was prolific in the past. So if, so a lot of these pest insects are going to be quite seasonal and we want to see them. They will show, they, they'll, they will appear, we will see them and then we know that, that the problem is there. Having a pest problem in the past doesn't necessarily prevent a plant from performing in the future. If an apricot isn't pushing any fruit this year, there could be a couple of things. And then we usually go through the checklist of, is it getting watered uh, effectively and efficiently? Means deep and less often, letting it dry out between watering. Was it planted properly? A lot of times, especially if we got bare root, over time, the soil builds up around the crown. It just soil settles, it moves, soil's always moving around our gardens, we don't always really see it. So making sure that we are able to move the soil away from the crown and that we always feel that top layer of roots, we wanna be able to feel that. Um, I would go and make sure, um, did it need to get pollinated? Um, has it been fertilized lately? Is it getting enough sun? During the blossom period, back in the early spring, late winter, did we happen to get a storm to knock off all those flowers? Did the flowers get damaged in any other way? Uh, how was flower production? These are all the things I would start to look at. As far as whitefly on um, a nectarine, wait, apricot, I'm not familiar with that specifically. Uh, something I can share that I'll do if I'm not really familiar with an insect be, or a plant being prone to an insect that I think it has, I'll go to the UCIPM website. In the search bar, I'll type in apricot. All the pest problems of an apricot will come up. And then through process of elimination, I can kind of hone in on what I think it is. Then you can either email me or go to the Our Water, Our World website, ask the expert email them that question and then 
between them and or myself, we can get you the right diagnostic and then the right solution for management. Great. Um, so those are all the questions we had in the Q&A. Um, if anyone else had any other questions and they'd like to ask them live, you can use the raise hand feature and we can call upon you um, or you can continue using the Q&A option. Um, and I guess we'll just give it a few more minutes before we wrap this up in case anyone else had any. I was curious if the person that had the leaf miner on their beats and chart, if you're still here, can you raise your hand? Because I wanted to add one more thing. I wanted to talk. Okay, great. I, there's a beneficial nematodes. I, mean, I briefly talked about it. Uh, sometimes I talk about it in this program. Um, it, we can buy them either at your local garden center or you can get them through Rincon Vitova. There's three species. Make sure you get the right one because they actually eat hundreds of different soil dwelling insects. And most of the soil dwelling insects that I'm talking about are those in larva form. So beetle larva, such as grubs, uh, cutworm larva, flea larva, um, excessive ant colonies, but specifically the, uh, the, um, uh, the leaf miner that gets on the beets and chard, their larva will uh, stay in the soil and emerge as that um, pest. So that's why if we can inoculate the soils with beneficial nematodes, those nematodes will feed off of that larva, break the life cycle. However, if we've had the, um, it's really hard. I mean, if your neighbor has them, they can fly over. It's just a, it's a, tough insect to manage in our area, but working with beneficial nematodes will help reduce the populations. Great. Well, we got a few more questions coming in. Um, so one, uh, someone's asking, so I got a bee box for wits and bees from Costco, but haven't seen any going in and out. Um, do you know if this is a good box to keep in the yard? I would look at the, there's should be a number of different hole sizes. And if it is for a specific species of bee that'll have a specific hole, I would do a little search and hopefully through like um, the uh, North American Bee Society or, you know, like Xersis, something like that. Uh, I would look and see if that's the right hole size for that bee. If that block is actually appropriate for the bee that you want to attract. I have some, um, Xersis has a couple of really great books about attracting beads native bees in your garden. And I meant to um, actually have some photos of those resources. And I kind of, I'm just now remembering, so I apologize. But you can uh, check out those books and get some more information. But from there, I would say uh, you might try finding a new location and then try to plant a lot of flowering plants in the area if you haven't already that you know that that bee is going to be attracted to. Specifically, again, in swaths of three feet because that's what I'm learning um, is going to be ideal when we're trying to uh, create habitat for our native bees. Great. Um, could you elaborate what is chunky arbor wood mulch? Yeah, so when we, we can buy mulch in a number of different ways. One, we can just take advantage of the leaves that have fallen from the trees in our garden. We go to the garden center and buy bags of mulch. Typically that's going to come as a little tiny uh, chip, like a fur uh, bark chip, quarter inch size, three quarter inch size, half inch size. Uh, in, well, when I was a kid, there used to be this really big chip. It's like two to three inches. It's not so popular anymore. You can go to the local gardens, um, landscape supply like Lingso. They'll have a number of different types of uh, mulches you can buy in bulk, such as uh, fir bark, quarter inch minus, quarter inch to half inch. They'll have shredded cedar, shredded redwood, and then they'll have something called arbor mulch. The arbor mulch is what the local uh, tree arborists, the tree trimmers that are out there, uh, like Davies Tree Service, they're working at someone's property, cutting down the trees. Trees are going through a big chipper, makes a lot of noise. Then Linkso has a contract with a couple of these companies that are very um, 
have high integrity, they know they're not going to be receiving any wood that has diseases or bark beetles or anything like that. And they um, will buy the chips from them and then sell them to you at a very, very good price. It's the most economical mulch you can buy at a landscape supply. It's always the least expensive one. It runs about 20 or $25 yard great cost, but it's going to be in a lot of different size chunks because that chipper isn't so precise. And it's kind of cool because sometimes you might get a combination of bay and it smells really good or you just never know what you're going to get. But I like the Arbor Mulch because it has a tendency to be one, in my price range, but two, it's because of the different sizes, it's not all going to decompose at the same time. It's going to have some longevity, but it's also going to feed the soil as it decomposes. It's also going to do all the amazing things that mulch does, like, you know, reduce water evaporation, keep the soil cool in the summer, warm in the winter, provide habitat for a lot of our beneficial insects. So that's what I mean by arbor mulch. Great. And speaking of mulch, is eucalyptus mulch okay or should it be avoided? There seems to be conflicting opinions about this. Yeah. So um, eucalyptus mulch is kind of tough because of the oils in the eucalyptus are actually used oftentimes as a pesticide. Mm -hmm. Or I see that as an active ingredient in a lot of the um, eco-friendly pesticides. Mm -hmm. I also know that things have a tendency to not want to grow around eucalyptus trees. So if I'm trying to plant a garden, I don't want to plant something and then put a repellent or something that's going to kind of suffocate it on top, prevent it from growing. I would say that um, use in moderation and just try it out. And if it works, then, you know, it works. And if it doesn't, then you'll know that it probably wasn't the right thing to you do. I know eucalyptus can just be a problem. Great. And we had a, um, a question. Um, if you can go back to the IPM website, um, the person who asked about the apricot uh, question was wondering if you could repeat the suggestions for investigating problems um, with troubleshooting a, an apricot tree that was not blooming. Yeah. Excellent. Happy to. So here is, um, well, this isn't really the page I get, but what I do, because I can never remember this website link, you know, ipm.ucdavis.edu. It's too much for me to type. So in the search bar of my web browser, I just type in UCIPM. And that's the first thing that comes up. I might even do UCIPM nectarines. And then that page is going to come right up at the first and I'll, I'll scroll down, click on it, opens up to the page of nectarines. Uh, if I am not doing nectarines, if I just do UCIPM, I'll open up to the home page. You can either access the search button at the top or you can just dive into the website entering home and garden. Don't go into commercial ag or any of that. Just go into home and garden. From there, there's a search bar, I'll type in nectarines. But then what happens is all the pest problems of nectarine comes up. And then through process of elimination, I read through and I can hone in on seeing what is the problem. I can identify what the pest is. If it's not on the UCIPM website, it's not a pest that the nectarine gets in our area. This is specific for California. We live in a Mediterranean climate. This website addresses pest problem solving and pests of our climate. That's why proper identification, identification is key. And if we read an article from like a Florida website or like Purdue or um, Cornell, sometimes it's not going to line up right. So that's why it's so, uh, favorable for us to focus on our research at UCIPM. From there, uh, feel free, you can always take a picture of the insect. Uh, it's not always easy. And there's some parameters like having a pencil next to it so you can kind of see this a scale or having like a small ruler next to it so there's a scale. You can always send me the picture or you can email at Our Water, Our World, there's that feature, Ask the Expert. You click on that, opens up to an email, you ask your question, and then you'll get an answer within 24 hours, Monday through Friday, for uh, 
typically what the pest is and then management solutions for that that are always going to be eco-minded. So I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Um, so we have um, the same person who's asking again. And I guess, um, Pamela, if you don't mind, um, perhaps maybe you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, and so maybe I think that would be easier. Great. Hi, Pamela. Hi, Pamela. Hi. Uh, hi, Suzanne. Thanks so much for your um, wonderful information. I was just making notes really quick, quickly on the wonderful suggestions you had for trying to figure out, you know, have, have I planted the apricot tree properly? So you did talk about, and I'll just be real quick, the watering, you know, evaluate that. Uh, make sure that um, it's planted properly. And one of the things you talked about is uh, the root bowl or top layer of roots exposed. That's great. The third thing I wrote down, what I think you said something about fertilizing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fourth thing you said was, um, uh, you know, and this is something you would have to think back, were the blossoms set properly? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, did we have a storm? Were they damaged somehow by rain? And I think you, did they get enough sun? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then I know you said to check the IMP website, but I felt like there was another suggestion you could, uh, you made where, you know, I could just go out and look at my tree and, and I definitely will check the IMP website. But I felt like besides the water, the planting, the fertilizing, the sun, and then, you know, kind of the historical history with the blossoms, was there something else you said I could kind of take a look at and scope out my own tree um, and where it's located and so forth? Okay, well, I was just looking up really quick that uh, hopefully the variety, I think all apricots maybe are self-pollinating. I wasn't sure if it needed a pollinator. So I was just, t I was just uh, doing quick research really fast, but it says that most apricot trees are self fruiting. So they're called self pollinating. So that's one. Um, okay. If you're not sure, I would say check out Dave Wilson growers, okay. Dave Wilson growers. I know they have um, their website breaks into like uh, professionals and also for homeowners, just go into homeowners. And I know they're really easy to get in touch with. So you can always reach out to them and find out about the variety that you have if you need okay. a little bit more information on that. But I have noticed over the years that we will get right when our flower, our trees are in perfect blossom, either a significant rainstorm or a significant windstorm or a frost that will damage those blossoms and it will actually um, be problematic for, because those blossoms will soon be then the fruit. I can also say that uh, a question for you is, you know, apricots are summer pruners. You want to prune your apricot right after the fruiting season. So after it's done fruiting. Now this year, if it doesn't get fruit, it's going to be hard to identify, but yeah. you might have an idea of when it fruits. It's usually around June-ish, early July-ish. Yeah. And then you, the, its ideal is it's, it's ideal to prune right after that. You, it's not favorable to prune during the rainy months because they have a tendency to be um, prone to different fungal diseases that get into the branchlets and then you'll see dieback. Okay. And then if it doesn't fruit, am I still on or am I still, am I unmuted? No, you're still, I can still okay. hear you. If it and doesn't I fruit, can't remember now in retrospect, but if it never fruited, then that's a completely different problem, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, where I mean, if it never blossomed, I'm sorry. That's yeah. what I, Yeah, if it never blossomed. And I have to be honest, over the last eight years, 10 years, we're starting to see with that, that big stretch of drought and then with the rains coming back on and then our weather is really changing sadly. And so we're seeing a lot of unusual uh, fruit tree flowering habits going on that 
is not favorable to the fruit trees themselves. We see sometimes apples starting to flower in the fall. Um, it's weird. So all I guess I'm sharing is just to uh, ensure that your tree is the healthiest it can be and take some notes with like, okay, it's June 6th and this is what I'm noticing or whatever. You know, if it started to flower in March, take note of it. You know, I have a tendency to not take the notes as much as I'd like to or take a picture with your smartphone because then the, the date is going to be on there. So at least you have a catalog to kind of reference year to year, which I find helpful. And then I would um, make sure during the, this, before this next rainy season, I will pull, if I've got mulch around the base of that tree, which hopefully you do, I would kind of rake it to the side. I'd get some chicken manure, put some chicken manure around the drip line of the tree, put the mulch back on top or better yet, get some good uh, organic fruit tree fertilizer, sprinkle it around, chicken manure on top of that, mulch on top of that. Let that rainy season really uh, absorb all of that good fertilizer and those nutrients. Make sure you're pruning the end of summer. August is really a good time to do fruit tree pruning for apricots and cherries. And then uh, through the growing season, if you're a little concerned about the health, again, you're going to check and make sure that crown is exposed. You can have mulch all around it, but just make sure mulch is not, like a, it's a couple inches away from the trunk. And that when you're watering, it's watering really deep and it's not getting, it's really able to dry out a couple inches before you water again. And um, how many years has the apricot been in the ground? Uh, it's been in the ground um, five years, roughly. Okay. It was still, still pretty young. So I would, yeah, make sure you're checking all of those things. And uh, if you want to beef it up a little bit, I'm a huge fan of good quality organic liquid fertilizer. So you can go and get like EB stone fish and kelp or um, the uh, Pacific organics. Um, they have a couple brands or the agri thrive. These are products you could find like a Hassett's hardware or um, golden nursery, things like that. And mix it according to directions with water and then like a, a bucket or a watering can and around the drip line after it's been watered, apply this organic fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, maybe about once a month uh, from now through August. And, um, and then just see what happens. Great. That's so helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I, just a, a little aside, not to dominate, but I have a non-fruit bearing pear tree that we've had trouble with in the past. I just noticed it's all in leaf now. And then some branches have flowers at the end. It's the first time I've ever seen leafing and flowering. So that sort of addresses what you said about uh, these poor fruit trees not being able to figure out what's going on in our mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Okay, well, good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. You're so welcome. Great. Uh, well, those are all the questions that we had. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining our presentation today. I uh, hope you learned a lot of information. And as I mentioned before, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Bosco website um, where you can review it at your leisure. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day.